The music business is in serious trouble. Or is it? That depends on your perspective. Let's talk about it. From New York City, this is How to Fix the Music Business, and I'm your host, Jim McDermott. Welcome to How to Fix the Music Business. A brief word before we begin this episode. It was recorded live on location at A2IM's Indie Week 2016 in New York City. There's ambient noise during the interview, and in a couple of places I re-recorded my questions to make them easier to hear. Hopefully it won't be too distracting because this is a good one. This time around, we're chatting with a record company. You know, these days, success in the music business is about survival as much as anything else. Major labels can lose millions and still stand because they're owned by giant corporations. A couple of consecutive bad years for a major, and there's usually a purge. New management is brought in. The roster is overhauled. Maybe they're merged with another label. And there's a dreadful side effect that can come with these changes. Risk aversity. After a real downturn, you want a sure thing. So the music becomes progressively safer. And as we know, safe music is rarely great music. It's different for independent labels. Successful independents constantly reinvent themselves and rarely play it safe with the artists they sign and the music they release. The best indies are on point, way out in front of the majors, showing everyone where music is going. It's inherently risky stuff, especially when you're paying the bills yourself. Which is why the accomplishments of Beggar's Group are all the more stunning in retrospect. Founded by Martin Mills as the Beggar's Banquet label in 1977 during the height of punk rock, Beggar's Group has definitely navigated 40 years of changes in musical tastes and technology. They haven't just survived, they've thrived. Evolving into a label owner and distributor, Beggar's Group handles Matador Records, XL Recordings, Rough Trade Records, Young Turks, and 4AD. A cursory glance at the roster of acts they distribute is staggering. Jack White, Alabama Shakes, FKA Twigs, Radiohead, Warpaint, Grimes, The National, Adele. And over the past 40 years, they've been instrumental in bringing some of the most important alternative music ever created into the world by artists like Gary Newman, The Pixies, The Prodigy, Dead Can Dance, and Cocteau Twins. At the helm of Beggar's Digital Business is our guest on the show for this episode, Simon Wheeler. As the largest independent music group of labels in Europe, Beggar's Group can change the landscape of digital music with their strategic decisions. And Simon has helped craft and execute these strategies at Beggar's since 1997. He's been inside the guts of every significant digital music opportunity the industry has faced since the beginning. And in this episode, we get deep inside the streaming music landscape, what it means for independent labels, and where Simon feels we're heading after 20 years in digital music. I'm incredibly pleased to welcome to the show Simon Wheeler from Beggar's Group. Welcome, Simon. So what's your official title these days? I know it's moved around a little bit. I think it was uh, Director of Digital and New Business last time I checked. Yeah, it can be, be whatever you want it to be, to be quite honest. We're not, we're not huge on titles at Beggars, but, but I've managed the digital business for you know, the best part of 20 years now. And that, that remit covers you know, our sort of like direction, certainly strategic thinking around what's happening in the changing landscapes, all, all sorts of issues. It's the nature of working for, a, for an indie, really. So on the Beggar's website, there's a interview with your founder, Martin Mills, and he talks about what happened when the punk scene hit and how overnight it changed from a album business to a singles business and the gigs all changed and there was a quantum shift in the industry. He describes that time as an amazing, incredibly exciting sea change. I wonder with the 20 plus years you have in the digital music business, if you would define the current music industry and all the changes that it's experienced as an amazing, incredibly exciting time. Well, there's no doubt that the business is uh, in the middle of a lot of change and has been in the middle of a lot of change probably for you know at least 15 years or so since roughly the turn of the century. Um, which makes it sound a really long time ago, but anyway, 15 years is quite a while in sort of digital. Um, I mean, back from those days in the 70s where it went from the, like the album into the single around punk, I mean, arguably it's kind of been flitting between the two sort of ever since, I think, really. Um, and it's definitely gone back into sort of like an album's business, then with the dawn of iTunes, and it kind of like unbundled the album and made all the tracks available individually, which was 
you know, a huge change in, in, in context of how the business was run at that particular point in time when, when con consumers could just pick and choose the tracks that they wanted rather than having to buy the piece of work. Certainly, it, um, you know, it hurt those companies which, which worked on the basis of you've got a hit single and hey, we're going to make you buy the album. Um, arguably now we're sort of like stretching that even further but I mean you can't really take it much further than an individual track so going from you know unbundled album sales as downloads into into streaming consumption if you like you know I guess what's changed there it's still the same unit but it's being consumed instead of it all in one go that upfront purchase you know we're getting something that's been consumed literally in bite sized pieces each time you listen to it over and over again over the period of years so from the business perspective, that's even more challenging because you've unbundled the album, you're taking it down to its smallest unit, and then you're stretching the payment for that unit over a much longer period of time before you get a return on your investment. Yeah. So I mean, that's all the challenges, but you know, it, equally, all of these changes should be providing more opportunities. I think something like um, streaming and subscriptions can be really great for you know, companies such as Beggars, where, where I think we've always felt that our repertoire uh, would be appreciated by people if we can get it in front of them uh, and I think the shift to digital has enabled us to do that on a geographical level I think the shift to uh, streaming and consumption has done that on a, on, a, on a monetary level for people where you don't actually have to even put down your you know whatever it is your ten dollars your twenty dollars for an album once you're in the service you kind of got access to everything so there's no barriers to people being able to hear about cool music there's someone they've read about or they've heard about someone their friends told them about and just been able to go and listen to it so it's really sort of democratized access to music and 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 i think that's reflected in the market shares which which repertoire like ours and other independent labels have on these services which is far higher than it is in the overall market uh, and i think independence again can think truly globally as being one company whereas i think if you look at the major labels they're actually a whole set of individual companies based in different countries yeah. that they've got whether it's the internal politics or just the internal world this is my release that's your release um, so I think for them it's a bit harder to sort of like conceptualize this, this truly global nature because actually their business isn't one business it's, it's, it's multiple businesses so so I think the Indians are actually better equipped to sort of deal with this global marketplace you know strangely enough. Well certainly I know from when I was at Sony um, International that there would be countries that were lobbying to get an American release on a record for instance mm -hmm. and the American company just didn't understand it, couldn't be bothered with it, and eventually got forced to take it and put it out. And sometimes, to their surprise, they'd actually have a record that, that did something. And then yeah, all of a sudden, they were geniuses. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it's all very well when it turns out turns out great results. You know, everyone's happy, and you know, someone's someone can pick up the prize. But uh, uh, no, and I think that type of structure where, where where there are sort of competing interests isn't necessarily well. It's definitely not in the interest of the artist who thinks they're signing a global deal to a global company, but has found they've actually just signed a deal with an American company, and then they've kind of got to do the job to persuade other people or not, or even to persuade their local company to let other people be part of it. It's it's that that, that type of stuff has always scrambled my brains once I've kind of heard and understood how it worked there. So there was an interesting assertion made by a guy here at Indie Week on the streaming music panel, a guy from Cobalt Music, who said that real hits are when someone adds an album or a single to their personal collection and then listens to it again and again because you earn a lot more revenue from that as opposed to um, a playlist where someone might listen to a track once or twice, even though playlists are very popular on Spotify. So I'm wondering what you thought about people adding things to their collection and generating revenue over time versus playlists and how that might affect how record companies do artist development in streaming services. Yeah, well, if we if we think about how people use streaming services and access music via playlists, you might you may well discover a track on a playlist. I mean, there's 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 all sorts of data around that. But if you're just consuming the track on that playlist, it's more likely than not that that playlist will change and that track will no longer be there at some point in time, whenever that is. And if and if that's your only interaction and consumption with the track, but it's got a finite life you've played, it's no longer there anymore, you've forgotten about it, you're playing whatever else is on the playlist. Well, that's really not going to give you the longevity of consumption of that track, uh, which, which we're all looking for. So, um, Vantor was absolutely right in saying, unless people actually add it to their library, add it to one of their playlists, then, then there's nothing that goes on once that, once that original playlist moves on. So that is absolutely fundamental. Um, is it going to change how people approach artist development? Um, I think what we're seeing is that there's two very, very different schools now. 
you've got the uh, you've got the massive global hit school, which can trigger you know hundreds of millions of plays, if not you know billion and more plays nowadays. Uh, it's probably got a sort of a lifespan, but it's you know it's enormous. It's one track. It's enormous. That's it. It's a hit business. And then on the other side, you've got. Um, people who are still producing artists who are still producing the body of work like an album and as much as everyone thinks that, that and says that playlists are, are it this is it it's a new album it's how everyone's consuming music we're really not seeing that in our, in, in our business to that degree we're not saying that playlists aren't important but we are seeing that people are consuming albums or chunks of albums uh, it's quite interesting when we do our business reviews for, so when we get someone to play a track from one of our artists it's not just a track they go on to play two tracks three tracks they play four tracks without any more kind of work being done they're, they're, they're taking a bit of that journey of the album so I think people who come to play our artists will play an average of three point something or other tracks per artist in a, in a sort of a session rather than just going in it's one track on a playlist and then you're on to the next track in the playlist uh, so that means that a certain amount of people are, are definitely listening to the album quite a large amount of people if you're thinking that a lot of people are still only listening to one track on a playlist so to get that average to get that three point whatever it is people are definitely listening to pieces of work and uh, it's also worthwhile remembering and we didn't get it get into it on the panel yesterday unfortunately is that a playlist now there's another form of playlist which is curated by the artist they make the piece of work they, they put it in the right order and, and they put that onto the stream service it's called an album it's, it's this really sort of old concept of a playlist um, and someone spent a lot of time building that playlist to, to make it flow and have this piece of work and it was about a year ago I think that one of the larger services told me that 66% of playlists on this service were albums that someone's just taken the album dragged it into their playlist folder that's, that's their playlist and it's the artist album so that being the second second uh, type of use and I think where A&R in May change and, and this is more in our area is trying to work with artists whose work will stand repeated listens over a longer period of time you know you want that piece of work where people are still listening to that album 10, 15 plus years down the line there's definitely some albums in my you know, personal collection that I've been listening to since I'm a teenager and that was a bloody long time ago <laughs> yeah, so, so, so if you're thinking on that basis you need a certain amount of plays of a track or an album to, equivalent, to, to, to make the equivalent of a sale now if, if said album in your collection is something that you've listened to on a fairly regular basis over quite a few years it's quite likely that the revenue from that is going to generate more than it would do from a sale now, not every artist is going to make that piece of work, and, and if we could all just go, oh, we want an album which is going to stand the test of time, all of our jobs would be so much easier. But, yeah. I mean, that's where great A&R comes in. And, and, and I think looking at the, uh, you know, the catalogue which Beggars uh, is, is fortunate enough to represent and the artists that we work with, there's a lot of those artists which have stood the test of time. Now, whether that's the cult or whether that's uh, you know, the Pixies, for instance, which still, you know, it's incredibly popular thinking that their last certainly the last album that we worked with was like 25 years ago um, you know it's, it's that type of activity bands like The National nowadays I think are going to be another one of those artists um, you know it's clear that Adele is clearly going to be one of those artists you know so really I think uh, I mean, yeah, we, I mean, we could just sort of like go on with the name so so yes hopefully it will change that type of A&R to really invest in artist careers who are going to produce this body of work which is going to stand the test of time and I think that's that's what I think is really quite exciting from a, from a music fan's perspective as well as a business perspective. Do you think that because some of your labels have that kind of boutique vibe about them where someone, I, I know I would listen to a, a Matador record or a 4AD record just because of the name of the mm -hmm. label, mm -hmm. do you think that that kind of better positions you guys for for having that kind of, where someone will take a chance on a listen, whereas in this glut of content, I mean, I might listen to something just because it's on 4AD, where if it's not on a label I know, it, I guess the question I'm trying to ask is, the, do you think the label is more important to have an identity, not just the artist? Uh, I, I'm not going to say it's more important, but I think there's definitely some benefits to, to, to having a identity or being perceived as a... Um, 
you know, an arbiter of quality to some degree, if you like, you know, putting this recommendation stamp that it's on this label, therefore it must be of a certain either style or quality or or, or, or however you, you want to put it. And um, and it, I think I think we could do so much better out of that if there was a way of surfacing uh, say 4AD you know, as a great example you know you go and search for 4AD on most music services you're, you're going to find a few compilations it's not an easy way of like oh I'd like this label I'd like to browse this label's catalogue and that's something which we've been you know as, a, as an independent community talking to companies like Apple about pretty much since iTunes existed it's like please put in a label search put it, you know make it possible to search by label the metadata's there it's just adding that to the index that you can search for and, 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 and if there was one thing which would uh, improve the, um, I'd say uh, it, would, it would help the independent sector more than anything else would be for services to make, to make it possible to search via label so that where there is that identity and people have built up their kind of following, they can, they, they can really benefit from that exploration in that sense. Well, this is a good segue because um, I wanted to ask you about the rich catalog you have and that our industry is so hit driven. There, there's been data that's come out recently that older music, in a lot of cases, is being streamed more than new current hits on streaming services. So I'm wondering what, if anything, you guys are doing internally, organizationally speaking, to focus on the exploitation of catalog and give it a place in the streaming services on a par with the hunger for the new. I mean, I think, again, with streaming services, it's really sort of democratized people's access to a much wider range of music. So I think. Um, I think that's why there's 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 quite a lot of catalogue usage on the service or or older repertoire, however we're going to put it. So I think that's really interesting in itself. It's happened naturally. You know, people are like God. I haven't heard this record for ages. I used to play it when I was a teenager, when I was a kid. It's like you know, someone stole my copy. I left it at a party. It got trashed. Whatever the broken you know, up it, relationship. Yeah. That's the one you left out. Yeah. Girlfriend <laughs> yeah. took it. <laughs> yeah. No, there's all these things. It's like this is the reason why I haven't heard it. And, uh, but now I can. So I think that sort of uh, means of discovery has been sort of like pretty great for everyone. I remember when Spotify first came into our, uh, our office and like everyone signed up for Spotify, it launched in the UK and it's suddenly like you've just got this massive selection of music to play for and I saw everyone, literally everyone in front of their computers and their kind of hands were poised over the keyboard as they were thinking, okay I can listen to anything I want, what do I want to play? And pretty much that entire day it was all 50s, 60s and 70s music coming out because that's kind of where people went to that they hadn't heard for a while. Um, so. Uh, what was the thread of the conversation again? I've, I've, I've kind of gone off on something about <laughs> no, that. No, so it was, a, it was a meandering <laughs> question. Don't worry about it. No, the question was or, organizationally. I mean, because I, 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 I worked uh, in distribution uh, uh, yes. for a while, yeah, and there yeah. was a cat. There would be like a catalog person to go yeah. and plug at the stores to do catalogs. Yeah, so yeah, do yeah. Have, Yes, we absolutely do have a catalog um, uh, person, you know, working the company and catalog. As I was saying earlier, has always been very, very important for us as, as a company. As, as, as my boss has said many times, the catalogue is what keeps the lights on. Yeah. Um, and um, so, so we do have a reissue programme to go through and try and try and um, surface, you know, items and try and present them in a fresh way. We're not trying to, you know, we're very careful that we're not there just kind of like churning out the same things and expecting people to kind of buy it because clearly that doesn't work in a consumption world because no one's buying it it's just the same music but but we're trying to sort of package things up whether it's an anniversary around something or or, or whether you know it's going to remasters or or higher definitely you know, whatever reason there is someone's touring you know thankfully the pixies always seem to be touring so that's great we can carry on doing lots of work with those um, but I think being able to surface these things within a within a consumption based surface service is quite hard still because everyone's kind of almost fixated on the new and the shiny yeah. um, and trying to get profile with these things with, with sort of catalogue stuff has proved to be quite challenging even though it's kind of what people gravitate to so yes we put some time and effort into it do we do it really well well probably not yet have I seen anyone really doing it well well not yet either you know I don't think we've really worked out how we kind of marry up this kind of like reissue world which may be kind of deluxe packaging and things like that into the digital consumption world where frankly packaging doesn't mean shit yeah. so so I think that's a bit of a work in progress there's a lot of value there it's really important to us but but I think we could do a lot more to to, to, to surface that but you know I'm, I'm up for all ideas is there is there a service do you think that gets that more than one of the others because it's interesting just as a fly on the wall to hear how 
everybody is talking about Spotify, Spotify. So if it was a percentage ratio, maybe 90% of, the, of what I've heard, the name I've heard, 90% is Spotify. Then a little Apple Music. Nobody has mentioned Rhapsody slash Napster. Nobody's mm-hmm. mentioned Tidal. Nobody's mentioned the international players, that are, the streaming players in the territory. It's, uh, it's kind of funny. I think it's quite natural that Spotify gets most of the attention because they've kind of been leading the way and yeah. now obviously Apple's making up a lot of ground. I think actually when Apple launched, some of the, you know, they clearly put a lot of effort into sort of trying to help people dive back through the catalogue. There was a lot of like focusing on particular artists and having rare cuts. I mean, there were some pretty obscure things in there, which actually I really enjoyed as a fan. Yeah. But say, like, a band like McCluskey, it's going into, like, you know, a deep dive and rare cuts of McCluskey. I mean, this is a band that hardly anyone knew about. Certainly people didn't buy their records, as amazing as they were. But but yet there's a major service who's going into sort of, like, B-sides and deep album cuts and, and presenting a playlist like that. So I thought that was, that was really, really interesting. Uh, now, whether that's something which can be maintained on an ongoing basis, we've, we've kind of yet to see. Uh, I think you know, one company that kind of hasn't got mentioned at all, or not that I heard it, is, is, is Amazon and, and some of the work that they're doing. And clearly once they, um, once, well, well they've got a prime service which is only focused essentially on uh, music which is more than six months old uh, for a start. So it sort of almost deliberately doesn't focus on the new. It's obviously licensing and financing reasons were driving that rather than, rather than they thought that's where the market is. And uh, if, if the stories are true that they're going to roll out a, uh, a, a sort of like more sort of regular, if you like, and, and full catalogue service, uh, I think with the amount of data which they've got from the sales on, you know, an activity on the site for over God knows how many years, I think that could be really, really interesting. Um, equally, someone like Pandora's doing lots of interesting work, surfacing data and being able to dive in deeper there. So, so yeah, there's lots of other stuff outside the sort of like the let's talk about playlists and let's talk about streaming and it's Spotify closely followed by Apple. There's a whole bunch of people that aren't even on demand streaming, you know, like the Pandoras, uh, you know, of this world, which is which is just as valid, I think, in this conversation. Well, and I guess if Pandora themselves launch a service, a subscription, you know, that'll that'll be interesting too. Yeah, but if they they they, they come and join the sort of like the paid premium subscription model, but coming from the radio angle, I mean, I think that'd be an interesting interesting addition to the market coming out from that angle rather than just going well here's another company with a 999 streaming yeah. service because you know it's, it's getting a little bit crowded uh, it's not, it, we haven't got all the players in America but you know some countries like Australia kind of you know at one point they had you know overnight they had like eight services in the marketplace all offering in a, you know the 999 equivalent service so um, you know clearly that isn't going to work in the longer term we do need people to differentiate on the model uh, I'm I'm personally not convinced that the idea is to differentiate on price, um, but but we certainly need people coming out from a different angle, trying to trying to make a different value proposition for people, and uh, and trying to get more people into this premium market because that's got to be the end game for everyone. Yeah, I mean, if Pandora did launch in it as a, a really good subscription service that was a really super deep level of curation, so that when you access the service you were getting something almost like a, a, a mixtape that a friend made you, mm-hmm. that, that would be a differentiator that I might decide to pay for that. Yeah, well they certainly got enough data over you know, a long period of time from a lot of users. I mean, the amount of data they're sort of like carrying and able to mine is, is quite extraordinary. So, um, so yeah, we're all really interested to see what they can deliver. And um, yeah, you know, I, I think the more people trying to do interesting and innovative um, uh, work in this area, no, the healthier the industry is going to be. Cool. Um, how do you feel about exclusives? Good thing or a bad thing in the digital services? Well, I think we need to be careful what we call an exclusive and what we're talking about here. Because uh, it mixes with windowing, I guess, a little bit. I- um, I'm, I'm, a little, yes. Um, I think if we're talking about like the core release, you know, the the artist album, if you like, being the being the core part of the campaign and exclusives, uh, I'm pretty firmly on the side that that's not great for anyone apart from the one company that has the exclusive, whoever that is. I don't think it's good for the consumer. I don't think it's good for the market. I'm, I'm fairly certain it's not good for the artist. Uh, I think you can point to the Beyonce's and Drake's, but frankly, they're Beyonce and they're Drake, and there's one Beyonce and there's one Drake, and and no one else is, you know, is either of those two. So I think to be able to point to those and go, look, it's amazing when you do an exclusive. Look, all this happens is 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 kind of disingenuous, really. Um, you know, I think for the superstars of the market, they can kind of do what they want, and it's sort of going to be great anyway. 
Uh, I think for everyone else in the marketplace, I think I think you want to make sure that your music's available wherever consumers want to want to uh, feel comfortable going to consume their music in a legitimate sense. Um, and then I'd much prefer the services to compete on their quality of service to the user rather than compete on well maybe who's got the deepest pockets and chuck the most money to get the most exclusives because I don't think that's a great long-term solution for anyone. So how do you manage that if an artist says that to you, if an artist, let's say, has a relationship with a service? Because I mean, Tidal being a good example, but you guys as a, as a label group, if an artist says, I just want to put it one place, do you, you have to... Do you just have to just have the conversation with them and try to reason with them, or uh, can, or, or do, you, do you ever say like, no, we're not going to do it that way? Well, we'd never say no because uh, that's not what we are as a company. But we'd like to have a conversation and we'd lay out our thoughts um, and we can show what different segments of the market are, are kind of worth to them as an artist. Um, and when I think if we rewind a bit and go back to you know when it was a kind of a predominantly physical market, if you like, and just go actually. Would you only want to put your music into, I don't know, Walmart? And I know it does happen occasionally. Would you, would you like to cut off, you know, 60%, 70% of the market and just service this part of the market? I mean, it's a kind of a crazy idea unless someone's going to chuck a load of money at you. Now, is that the best thing for the market or the artist's career? Well, obviously there's a price when everyone goes, well, that's probably the price which is worthwhile paying. But it's, it's not a very healthy situation. So, and again, it's... It, Different services perform very differently in different markets. You know, if we're in a world where we're all one market and we're just thinking about one country and who's in that market, that would be a much simpler conversation to have. But frankly, there's 200 plus countries in the world. There's services which are available in a lot of those countries. There's services which people wouldn't have heard of in any of the Western markets operating in different places around Latin America and Southeast Asia and Eastern Europe and Russia and places like that. So we're we just going to cut all those out of the mix, I and mean, I don't think that, that that makes much sense at all. We want to have a you know we want to have a diverse, rich marketplace where there's a range of offerings and consumers can take their choice wherever they feel comfortable. And I think the more that we can do as rights owners, that's artists, managers, labels, publishers, everyone in this mix to encourage that. I think the better we're all going to be in the future. We don't want one company to dominate that's that's never healthy in any marketplace whoever it is and with whatever intentions they've got it's just not a healthy situation to be in if you were going to fix the music business what would it look like well there's all sorts of things which would be interesting i mean clearly the music business is incredibly complex and more complex than it really should be if it was being invented now i think um, i understand why it's complex but i've worked in the business for long enough to know that I think the licensing of there being master rights and publishing rights, but within publishing rights, there's a there's a like a reproduction right and a performance right, and then there's a right in the lyric. I mean, there's all these kind of like different rights, which are a bit labyrinthine. And I think if we could simplify that, then I think that would be one item which could do an awful lot of good in the business. Now, you know, I absolutely understand that a song is different from a recording and to bundle those things together kind of isn't naturally how it's how it's works but i think if we could do that and go actually you want to license some rights there's a one-stop shop in some sense this is where you can license the rights for everything uh, you know that would that would be a massive boost to innovation and development in the marketplace um, if there's a slightly second thing i wish that some of the regulatory authorities over the past sort of like 10 to 15 years would have taken a bit more uh, notice of consolidation in the marketplace and maybe not allowed so much of it to take place so there was a greater diversity of players currently as it stands I think there's a you know there's currently three players in the marketplace you control arguably far too much you know, the power is in the hands of too few so maybe if we can rewind the clock on that and, uh, and maybe uh, put uh, some obstacles in the way for some of that consolidation then I think that would lead us to a healthier world as well. I guess this this would probably be the toughest or most uh, controversial question. The 50-50 streaming split that you guys had with artists, do you think that it's possible to get into a place with artists where you're essentially 50-50 partners and that becomes a standard kind of a thing within the new music business? Well, I think to be clear, when we were paying through 50% of our streaming revenues to artists, it was a nascent business we were 
not contractually obliged to do that at all. We were we were paying out far in excess of what our contracts with our artists said that we had to. And we did that voluntarily, and we did that because we wanted to encourage adoption and confidence in a growing marketplace. And we were paying through 50% of gross. We weren't taking, there's no deductions on any of that. I mean, that's 50% of gross revenues. It was super generous, but you know, when you're a private company, that's the kind of decisions that we can make and feel comfortable with. We always said that once the market started to develop that we'd have to review that, but actually we couldn't, we couldn't make that decision until we saw how it was going yeah, to develop. Yeah. And, and it definitely developed a lot faster than what, what we expected. What's become clear is that even though we are a profitable company, you know, we are, we're, we're still relatively small in the scheme of things, but we're, we're profitable, which for a record company is quite hard work. But we could never generate enough margin if we were paying 50% through to our artists to, to be profitable and stay in business and invest in artists the way that we are. It's, the economics just that no one, but no one, generates a 50% plus margin in their business. It's just not possible. You know, if you can generate a 20% margin in your business, you're doing incredibly well. And, and that's maybe paying out on a royalty of whatever that's going to be, somewhere between, you know, say 15 to 25%, depending on what the, whatever it is. So clearly, if you're generating a 20% margin and you're paying out, say, 20%, 25% average on royalties, then, then you can't get to 50% on royalties. You know, you're going into a loss. I mean, I think it's just pure, simple mathematics, say that if you want to invest properly and market your artists, you know, in the way that we feel comfortable, we can't do that if we're paying through 50%, which is why we had to review it. And we're still paying a generous royalty on streaming. We haven't said what it is publicly because actually it's sensitive information. I'm sure our competitors would love to know what we're paying so they could try and find a way of making themselves look more attractive. Uh, but we're paying more than we're contractually obliged. We have a very generous rate set out for all of our current and future contracts that we're trying to work with. And then there's always exceptions to those rules where you break all the rules and you do something different because that's what you want to do. And that's who the act is. And they maybe yeah. require it to get the, to the signature on the paper. You're going to have to do something. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think each 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 contract you're looking at has 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 slightly different mechanics to it, and we try and put it in a you know a rough type of formula so we're not trying to reinvent the wheel every time but we understand how our business works we understand the economics of our business very well we can explain actually if you want us to do this and you're expecting to take that amount of money for us then how are you expecting us to invest in it and and, and is that a relationship that you want where the person that's managing your rights can't invest in it because they're not making enough money so uh, you know, there's lots of conversations to have. Some people are more reasonable with those conversations than others. Well, and if they're unreasonable, I guess they could just sell yeah. direct to consumer and do it themselves. I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, there's plenty of other options. There's other labels to work with. I'm, I'm, I mean, this is the we've we've constructed our business for the way which works for us. I'm not going to say it works for any other company. I mean, it might do, it might not. And, and everyone's up to free to run their companies in the way which they see fit on you know on terms which they're comfortable oh. with. Um, you know, as far as beggars is concerned, you know, we're very fortunate to be 100% independent still, you know, pretty much 40 years down, down the line from, from the from inception. Uh, we want to remain independent and we can't do that if we're losing money. You know, we need to at least break even. In fact, my personal motto in doing business is try not to lose too much money. Last question is, do you have a record that people should run out and buy right now? And what is that record? Anything. Well, anything. <laughs> well I, I, I can't say there's a record. I would say that if, if people haven't really uh, experienced the national, both on record and as a as a live act, then they'll really miss out on something. Out on something. I think they're the, you know, I think they're one of the m most important uh, rock acts in our, of our time. Maybe not the most popular, but I think in terms of quality uh, of their records and and the intensity and excitement of their live shows I think they're, 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 they are one of my personal favourites so I'd say do that uh, we have some really exciting records coming up as, as, as always but I've been sat with a lot of our labels this week hearing what they've got coming up in the next you know for the rest of the year 4AD have got an act which they signed called Lemon Twigs they're super young they're in crazily crazily talented and they've made a record which belies their sort of like, you know, really young years. It's, it's just an extraordinary mix. It's it's got uh, you know, classic Beach Boys in there. It's got bits of 
and you know it's very sort of like classic in terms of 60s 70s style songwriting and musicianship but it's very very much a modern record um, they've got a sound, song out on their soundcloud now uh, and I think that's that's going to be one of the one of the most awesome records of the second half of the year cool so we'll check out uh, Lemon Twigs and 4AD excellent all right That'll do it for this episode of How to Fix the Music Business. I'd like to give a special thanks once again to Simon Wheeler from Beggars Group for coming on the show and joining us and sharing his thoughts. And I'd also like to give a shout-out to the folks at A2IM for throwing such a great Indie Week 2016. They actually invited me to do a keynote at the event, which I'll put in the show notes if you'd like to read a transcript of the address that I gave. And if you're enjoying How to Fix the Music Business, please do me a favor hop onto iTunes and leave us a positive review. It will help elevate the visibility of the show, which will enable me in turn to continue bringing you great guests like Simon. And if you have any questions about any of the stuff that we're talking about, if you have any questions about anything that's happening in the digital music business in the past, the present, or even the future, hit me up on Twitter, at The Trickness. You can just send me a tweet, ask me a question, and if it's a good one, I'll read it on the show, and we'll talk about it a little bit. Anyway, thanks again very much. And one last thing. I think I forgot to mention how Simon and I met. The first time you and I met uh, was when I was working for five weeks for LimeWire. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and what you said to me, you were very polite. That was when I was running their, their, their store. I was at South by Southwest. And you were, you were really polite because when I started the job, I told them, everybody I meet with is going to say, fuck you. I don't want to do anything with you. And, I, and you, like, you're like, yeah, guys, great, let's meet. We met at some re- Mexican restaurant or something. And the first thing you said to me was, after we gave you the whole pitch on the store, was, I will be happy to do business for you and we'll put all of our content into your service as soon as you write us a check for all the music that got stolen on the line where we mm-hmm. up to some kind of settlement. <laughs> and I, which is a fair answer, you know? And it, it was a much nicer answer than anybody, anybody else had. So I just <laughs> wanted to ask, now that we're like, Eight years down the line, did you ever get a check from LimeWire? What happened with that? Because they got shut down. They got. They, it was a big judgment. Did you guys actually get a check over uh, that, or what? Uh, what I believe happened in that, that is that uh, the major labels and the IFPI, in some sort of like configuration, settled with LimeWire on behalf of the whole industry. So I believe uh, it's just that no one else got to see any of the money. So you guys didn't get anything at all. Oh, man. I'm sorry. Well, you learn from these mistakes, and uh, you, know, you just need to keep an eye on the ball. But certainly, uh, people settling on behalf of rights which they didn't have, you know, would certainly take a fairly dim view of that. And maybe that's not the end of that particular conversation. <laughs> I doubt it is. All right. Thank you so much, man. Hey. I really appreciate you taking the time. Pleasure. Pleasure. Good talking so to you. Good talking to you as well.